first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for doing me the honor of inviting me to give this series of talks, of lectures. And having said that, I should say that I'm the black sheep in the group of the lecturers, uh, I think, which you can see by my closing. And I'm the black sheep because everybody else is doing topological data analysis, and I'm talking also mainly about curvature, which is proper geometry. But there is, of course, there is a lot of connection between them, and you will see that as well. So I divided my talks into three parts. Uh, one part is about the curvatures of networks. The second one, you will feel more at home, it's about persistent homology and curvature. And the third part, it's about, I don't know, it's about met metric invariance, again, for networks, let's say. OK, so uh, without further ado, that's important to say. And another thing which would be important to say before I start, so I this is a list, I don't know, there is a lot of mathematics, but the list, it's not very formal in this lecture. So um, it's more motivated by its application in uh, in a lot of fields, you'll see, and in data science and so on and so forth. So it's a bit more flexible, and it's largely, I present also results done with a lot of people uh, from many places, but most of the stuff is done with or motivated by with the group of Professor Jürgen Jost from uh, Max Planck in Leipzig. And that's also which I thought would be celebrated. Okay. So having said that, I should start. OK, so uh, first of all, the motivation. Why should I do all of this? Because uh, networks, complex networks are called these days, appear everywhere. So there are these social networks which people are addicted to, like Facebook, Twitter, or I should say X these days. Biological networks, of which you'll see some results. Also, they are cool. I mean, it's something for a mathematician to hope can contribute there. Transportation networks. Actually, I should say that things started here some at least 50 years ago, if not more, in architecture, actually. I mean, they started for it to use and communication networks, which somehow get a business. So you can think of them as data representation. And then you have to have some models. And you do mathematics, you want to do have some models. And there is something to say about these models. So till recently, everybody said, OK, networks are graphs. But I should take some time out already and say, well, it's not quite so because in 2016, if I don't, I'm not mistaken, I went to a conference in social networks and I said, well, you know, networks are graphs. Are they? We were doing, you know, they're speaking prose and they didn't know that. So not everybody knew. I mean, for mathematicians, computer scientists is trivial. For everybody else, it's a new realization that networks graphs are basically the same. And, um, but somehow, so therefore, if you have graphs, people look at uh, node or vertex-based measures, like the very classical clustering coefficient, or if you prefer something more differential geometric than the scalar curvature, uh, which of which perhaps I'll talk a bit later. And but a network, it's it's not just. The vertices. It doesn't. If you have just computers which don't talk between the two of them, you don't have a network, computer network. You don't communicate. So therefore, you have to look at uh, the edges and the Tessa measure to these edges. And recently, a measure which has somehow a type of measures for attached to edges, which has started to permeate the field, is that of Ricci curvature of which I'm somehow also guilty of propagating. And um, and recently people started to say, no, 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 you shouldn't just look at uh, edges, nodes, 
And edges you should also look at faces, and then you have simplicer or more general polyhedral complexes. So the motivation for me is of polyhedral complexes. So as somebody who comes from proper differential topology background, I would say, well, no big deal. Just just divide, take the diagonal, so let's say, and you'll have a you'll pass from a polyhedral to simplicial context. So this is a classical uh, mathematical setting, where it's not quite the same in applied sciences. But I'll talk about that in a jiffy. For now, um, why polyhedral complexes? They are natural. Everybody does this knows what they are, even people in graphics and stuff like that, proper applied people, um, not just mathematicians, that's what I'm trying to say. And they appear in this super cool, modern blah, blah, hyper networks and multiplex networks and so on and so forth. And that is very natural to, um, to model them by using polyhedral complexes. So there is some work which I did with Melanie Weber, Weber who is now at Harvard, and another stuff. This is kind of natural, but not easy to use. There's a canonical way of doing it, but that's less important for now. What I'm trying, this is motivated by work of Bloch. Bloch. Anyhow, um, but there are other ways of doing that. I, Again, in a, a few years ago, this sounded esoterical. Now it's common, I would say. So why are they, should we look at polyhedral complexes? As I said, they're ubiquitous. They're all, everywhere. This is a classical um, social network. It's a very small one. And if you want to understand something, you have to look at small ones. So again, in social networks, I have something with 3 million edges. You can't see anything. It's a big blob. Yes, but these guys have um, this a social network of dolphins, I re if I think so, and you can see you have uh, you have triangles and you have these foregones, but and so on and so forth. So uh, they appear. Uh, this is a, a less nicer drawing, but it explains some things. So if you have so you have points and you have edges and then you have triangles, which I have filled in. But you have foregones and so this is a proper foregone and this is a tetrahedron. So when people do, so what you saw, sorry, wanted to ask something? Okay, so I, I was trying to say that when you do persistent homology, when you do Rips complex, whatever, you just plumb in faces in a way or another canonical. But in real life network, it's not the same. It's not the same if I have uh, four people who work together to collaborate on a paper and they know each other or they know each other in pairs. So I am work, I am talking to you and you are talking to Fred and so on and so forth. Yes, and in the end, we all collaborate in this talking, but not together at the same time. Think of this as four proteins, which together produce an amino acid of three genes, four genes, which produce an amino acid. And they are uh, three, uh, they are pairs of genes who. So, uh, this reminds me of hearing something about hyperplane networks. Yeah. Yes. I'm kind of confused how you can define curvature with that paradigm, but I'm not, I don't know. Well, then you'll have to wait a bit, yes. I'm not, so again, this is applied science. Okay, so this is applied science. I am not talking about dimensions and stuff. I'm doing they're real objects, maybe complicated, but they're sticks and balls. I mean, it's, if you want to understand my my approach, think of chemistry, high school chemistry, you have these nice molecules which are big red and blue balls and that, that, okay? Yeah, but, so yes, you can do it. So if you can see here is a more, here we approach a more formal rule. Okay, anyhow. Uh, so as I said, there 
everywhere. And that was a big surprise. This is a first result with Melanie and Jurgen. And um, so the thesis is that you shouldn't look at higher dimension, I mean, more general objects than triangles and tetrahedra, because that's what happens. That's what happens if we want to have it to happen, because mathematically is a decent thing to do. And that's what I did my PhD on that. I mean, that's what you do as a mathematician. But in practice, it's not like this. So you can see here some small uh, classical networks, social ones, peer-to-peer uh, -peer and to biologic, uh, biological network. And you can see that even in these very small networks, you have not just triangles, but quadrilaterals and pentagons and even hexagons and many other hexagons. Just a second. And I should say that if you, um, we played in a, another collaboration with people from Stony Brook, and we looked at these cancer motivated problems, and you have polygons of 60,000 edges. Of course, nobody knows how what sixty thousand endings means or mean not, or from a biological viewpoint. But yes. Yes. Ah, so uh, here you see, here you know, of course, that's very important. So then you have uh, to look at some correlations and stuff like that. There are ways of doing it here. These are canonical networks which you can download. They have it only starts with a, you just look at them, there's no combinatorial viewpoint. So these are the simplest examples. As I said, in practice, in biology, you have uh, networks with tens of thousands of edges, and you have to take in the, it's much more complicated to understand what a face is or is not. And that would, I would say that is indeed a very good question because designing what is a face, what is a common interplay of proteins or genes, whatever, it makes all the difference in the end, yes? Yes, and that's our goal, but that's, that's why I work with biologists, for instance, and I'm not, I, I learned to be modest. We tend to have mathematicians tend to say, okay, I know everything, it's very simple. You have an axiom for that, yes? It doesn't work quite like that in biology. I'm sorry. So this is, I, I, why should I talk when I have a nice slide to show, yes? So this is the difference between, um, you have proteins A and protein B, they work together. Then is a paper of the, you have two papers on, uh, two and a half papers sorry, on cancer. So um, with um, uh, Kevin Murgas and Romeo Sandu and Gretel Allen Tenenbaum. So here you have proteins, just let me, okay, sorry. I am happy you have questions. It's a, it's a Are we working with simple graphs or can there be multiple? Oh, that's a beautiful question. So usually we work with graphs, proper graphs. They can be oriented, directed. Okay, another thing, we call them directed. Network scientists call them uh, oriented. And they are not, uh, they can be even multigraphs now and then, but we, they are not pseudographs. They, I mean, it, you can do that. I have a trick or two for doing that, but usually you don't take loops into account because it complicates things and we want to it canonically more or less. Yes, so they are graphs. So um, here is the difference, but this is what I really want to say. So if you have pairs of proteins and you have a triangle, but you have triples of proteins collaborating in producing some amino acids, and you have a plumped in triangle or field triangle. And that's the difference between what I, what Fred presented. And that's no, you, you, when you do mathematics, you have to have an algorithm. Either you leave them like this, or you leave plumped in the faces, where in real life, it's not like that. And the real filtration would be to see how many of these you have. Mm -hmm. And there are people who do that, just that. Uh, explore this 
adding of faces from a probabilistic viewpoint. So I have some friends who do that. Um, okay. Okay, so if I may have some water, then probably I could speak better. Hmm. That should do the trick. Okay, so till recently, and I know many people who are much better mathematicians than me by far, and who work on this combinatorial method, sorry. But they don't capture um, enough they are good if you want to prove theorems, uh, but they are, capture very little of the underlying real life structure. Except, especially we have weighted networks. Yes, we have weight of them, just not just edges. And um, <clears throat> there is also common, and again, this is a big avenue of research of doing Laplacian and eigen, it's eigen values of many types of Laplacian and um, and they also have, are su sex successful, but the real McCoy is to look at the geometric methods. Okay, so that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to sell. Okay, so uh, among these geometric methods, curvature is the most famous, the most used. Why? Well, it's intuitive. Yes, everybody. I mean, you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that this. Uh, this planet is more curved than ours, yes? But, and it's not so esoteric, and actually, um, again, I'm going back to Moliere, and people were talking curvature a long time ago in combinatoric clustering coefficient is nothing but <clears throat> uh, Gaussian curvature, a combinatorial version of it, okay? So, um, another is a more deep, a deeper one, if you want, is uh, which I resides in this quote from of Robert regretted Robert Brooks, who said that the fundamental notion of this differential geometry is the concept of curvature, and I would say that in in fact curvature is basically ev ev what you do when you study geometry. So if you do axiomatics, you can talk about spaces of certain positive or negative curvature and so and so forth. So it's very natural to do that kind of stuff here. And among there are many flavors of curvature, but among the uh, those we prefer the so-called Ricci curvature. Uh, be why? Because it has it's very flexible and it gives you the best of two worlds. So it's not too it doesn't contain all the information. You can, don't get lost into it, and it's not doesn't crush it everything to one number. So um, what it captures is the growth of volumes, let's say of balls or whatever, and the dispersal of geodesics. So think of it: if you have a small cone starting from a point, and you have geodesic, this small cone here, and you see how much this volume grows on in this when you go epsilon. That's the growth of volume, but of it's clearly it also captures the dispersion of geodesics. Because think of it, you have a one direction, the axis of the cone, and uh, so you start in this direction with a group of people, let's say students in a field trip, and they start together, but they start going, each one picking flowers, stopping for uh, ice cream, whatever, okay? So, yeah, ice cream, I think, comes before this worm here. And um, so I like to say that Richie Curvature talks about the sociology of curves, of geodesics, about how they behave of the pen, the group, okay? Okay, so there is a, I mean, this is very nice, it's very intuitive, drawings are good, but if this intuition comes from this formula, which formalizes that, how uh, the volume grows as a function of Ricci curvature and of, of the distance, okay? So this is a the Ricci curvature version of a classical result whose goes back to 1848 to it's a pair of theorems. They call it the Bertrand de Gay 
why so? I don't know how to pronounce the name to be anyhow. And which says how uh, um, geodesic diverge in pairs, and this is for groups of geodesics, and it's important theorem. Okay, so the intuition behind it is this. I'm sorry, if I'm talking at very low level, I, I apologize. I prefer to be intuitive in the beginning at least, and to explain what I'm doing. So this is something uh, very intuitive in positive curvature. There is a big difference in the positive. Uh, so in zero curvature, if you start at a point, then you two people who start at a point, they keep going apart at a constant rate, yes? Which is proportional to the distance they went and to the angle, but the angle is the constant. If you are on a sphere, then two people would start one in this direction, one the other direction, they go farther away. The farther will be at the equator and then they meet again at the South Pole. That's true for everybody, for the pack of geodesics. Um, and volumes, of course, grow. Volumes, in this case, would be areas. And then they start, they can't go beyond the volume of the area of the sphere. In hyperbolic geometry, which this is a good representation, and this is uh, a rendering of the hyper, uh, hyperbolic plane, uh, conformal model. So the white lines are geodesics. They're infinite because the boundary is not contained. And all the fishes are the same size here. It's a conformal model. So as you can see, you can, um, this is an Asher drawing, of course. Uh, so they diverge exponentially fast because here is a, a circle at infinity. And also the volume explodes exponentially. There are more and more fishes as in each, in each layer. Uh, in an exponential manner. So this is also classical hyperbolic geometry, but it's a nice drawing. Anyhow, uh, so, okay, so Ricci curvature, it's a concept of classical Riemannian geometry. So being a concept of Riemannian geometry, higher dimensional manifolds, you have to talk about vectors and directions above their chains. So this means tensors. So tensors, uh, give the geometry a bad name, I would say, except if you are a physicist, then you would love them. So they are very technical. And in fact, this stuff started after the Second World War because people were tired of the, I mean, Cartan's program was a big success, but you didn't see any more geometry. So then Klingenberg, Klingenberg got back and reinventing this stuff. And since then, uh, many people liked it. Almost do the same. So this is not a, so we do differential geometry, but without any tensors. So the approach here is something like this, that I do synthetic and coarse geometry. What does mean synthetic? I prescribe what my notion, how my notion should behave, what its properties should be. And I try to write it like that, prescribe it like that. And it's coarse in the sense that it doesn't matter. That you don't care exactly what happens in distances. You can have some error in, in size and in place. So I think John Lott names this uh, Mr. Magoo geometry. You, you see the person, but you can't really see him. You guess his, you know, it's very myopic kind of geometry. Okay? So uh, about synthet, uh, coarse means like this. You don't really care for the objects, no. So there are some limits. So when I say this is a kitten, it doesn't work. I mean, it has claws, but it's not a good model. But this is a good one. When I say this is a giraffe, that's good biology and good geometry because it's they have the same family and there are only two living persons, so I mean, species, I mean, they're same genus or um, supragenus, whatever I, okay, so. For me, these are one and the same, yes? Okay. Uh, of course, I won't talk about giraffes anymore. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, I know there is a biology department that was far away, but still. Anyhow, um, so 
the first success when I talked to Roberto a week or two ago about this series of talks. So there we talked about a bit about the history uh, of this uh, discrete notion of curvatures, and it goes much farther back in time, but then that would be less fitting for this setting, perhaps, and perhaps a bit boring for you. So the most famous one um, is a relatively re recent one, is one of Olivier's, uh, and it was applied a lot in the, a few years back in complex communi in communications, biology, finance, and so on and so forth. Many people, Tenenbaum with Georgiou and David Gu and Jie Gao and myself, and especially GS students, and Shipping Liu on the other hand, and John Curry in, in electrical engineering and you know communication networks. So it's very mm, well known, so to say. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, it's not the, okay, it's not the oldest, but I wouldn't dare go about, speak about discrete geometries without mentioning this one because everybody would expect it. So it's supposedly very intuitive. And if you remember, when we discussed about Ricci curvature, it captures two things, growth of volumes and dispersion of geodesics. So when you had a classical notion, you do proper remaining geometry, tensors, blah, blah, then you have the whole thing. When you do discretization, as a something which people should understand, especially mathematicians, because we tend to be like, it's that you can't have everything at the same time. Discretization, you gain a lot of intuition, you gain simplicity, but you lose it a lot of you know, apparatus. Therefore, if each discretization captures something different, and usually you, you look at them and say, okay, but they don't fit at all. It's natural, but we'll see, they fit. They fit. If, if the discretization is good, it captures much more than it pretends or should. Okay, so why are they, people think it's intuitive? Because of this drawing. Uh, so this is again, uh, so this is Olivier's stuff, who says that if you have two balls, so, uh, okay, this is a drawing, I am, I'm writing balls, but, I, what I draw is circles or spheres. So this is classical Euclidean geometry. So you have two balls, they have a distance between them. And then the distance between this, between pairs of points on the spheres, between the spheres themselves is con the same. But on, on the sphere, they are closer because of how distance on sphere look like. And on hyperbolic plane, they are farther away because, again, the farther you go, distances you saw are not those. If you are so, it's like those thick bumpers on cars, you can see it, you are far away already. It's opposed to the cars. So, um, so why? So we draw spheres, but it's true for balls. Of course, it's harder to compare all the distances. So why balls? Because balls, when you think of balls, are ah, measures. So the general one is for it's a way of comparing measures, measures centered at these points. So it's a deep idea, and there is a formula for curvature, uh, for um, actually for positive curvature, which is this one, it's just a defect between the Wasserstein, the transportation metric, the cost of carrying all these points, and uh, the distance in your space, let's say Euclidean distance. So it's very intuitive, but it's far harder, at least appears intuitive because you can have this drawing and the nicer versions of it and everything is simple. Oh, it's simple. But it's not really simple because it's much harder to compute than you would expect. Even if you, the uh, weights here are the combinatorial one, I mean, i.e. one at every node. And it's so complicated 
that in practice, I mean, now you can do it because you have parallelized com computers and stuff like that. But, and I'll show you in my last lecture, I'll show you how bad it re can really be in practice. But uh, you need some optimization methods. And I have to tell you the truth. I mean, it's not just, I have nothing about optim against optimization methods. I just think that one should employ a notion and understand how it works as it is. Once you start doing smoothing, uh, embedding, and everything, you might lie a bit, yeah? Sorry, yes. So, Okay, so, okay, so if you are on a remain and manifold, then, the, and this is a small, this is a direction, they are very close, you look at epsilon. So this is a tangent vector. On a graph, I don't have tangent vectors. What I ha do have are edges. So edges are the discretization of vectors. So that's what we do with Ricci curvature for graph slash networks. We look at, the, we attach a measure, and that was my, uh, thanks for asking me, but that was the initial idea that I tried to put some, attach a curvature measure to each edge and not just to each vertex. Okay. Yes. No, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. Because again, I'm, I'm throwing all the water, but I keep the baby in, in the bath. I, we don't care about sparseness or stuff like that. Not here. The results, this convergence, and if you have a nice triangulation, da, da, da. But it doesn't matter. I, I'm doing this synthetic kind of geometry. So I'm trying to see, starting from this abstract thing, and I am prescribing one, a number, if you want, a quantity to each edge, and I call it Ricci curvature. Because it satisfies the properties of a Ricci curvature. This is a synthetic stuff. It's coarse because, okay, each here is less important. We don't do the coarse. Um, so I should say again that Ricci curvature is bad because it works, it's proper for, for edges. It doesn't see the higher dimensional structures. And actually it's horribly, it, it's hard for me to describe how hard it is to compute. So if you even if a small graphs, something like the uh, dolphins you saw, it's very, very hard to compute. Even if, I mean, even with combinatorial weights, with real life weights, God knows what happens. So if you want to do it for higher order phases, there are some nice works, very beautiful theory. It's Evans and some students, bless you. And, but, and I have an idea of how to do it, but in practice, you lie a lot. And again, people like it because it's very mathematical and can prove things about it. But in, if you are graph, a combinatorial graph, it's a graph like in school, like, you know, graphs 101 for architects, you can't compute, and that's what I leave you as an exercise because I'm, I don't do Olivia curvature, so it's not about that. You can't, it's not defined if you have uh, cycles of order six. So you have an edge, which is a, an edge of a uh, hexagon, you can't compute Olivia curvature. So, and if you remember, you have a lot of hexagons, not to say about 27 guns and stuff. Okay, so there is another approach, and this is one which I'm, it's profit. And this is one uh, pioneered by Robin Foreman, which is less intuitive, but easier to use. Yeah. You can't, it's not defined. It's not defined. Yes, it's not defined. 
Yes, you can't because you have to, you can't find this optimal transport. It's not defined. Ah. Remember, it's, so I should go back and it, I, I told you, ah, it's a very nice picture, isn't it? It seems intuitive. But there is this uh, bad guy looming in the dark which is Wasserstein distance. You have, still have to compute all the transportation plans along all the paths. It does, it's, not, it's not just you go from here to there. You might di distribute your mass and go the other way around. It's like a very complicated octopus or something, uh, zillion pus. Okay, so um, the other one is based on Robin Foreman. It's, um, let me know how, how much time do I have? Sorry. Okay. Perfect. So, there were questions. Just making an observation. Anyhow, so this it includes a geodesic dispersal. So if you remember, I told you that and this is important, not each discretization captures or models another property of the classical notion. So this captures the geodesic dispersal. We'll see why. Couple of slides. Its, it's approach is not based on, its definition not on transportation, but on the connection between curvature and the Laplacian operator, which is a very classical thing. And it's and what makes it beautiful for me at least, and it's ideal, I think. It's maybe not the most elegant mathematics. It, it's good mathematics, it's not the most elegant, but it's ready-made for complex networks and their generalization. Why? Because it was devised from the beginning for weighted cell complexes. So I should say CW complexes. So it's much more easier with Olivier. It's easier to see how it works, for, to theoretic at least, for combinatorial ones, but with the weights it's hard. Here, so they use some probabilistic distribution. But this is ready made for CW complexes, weighted CW complexes. And this is an object, a class of objects that uh, includes polygonal meshes and graphs and networks. So this is an example of graphs and net, a graph or a network computers and there are some weights on the edges, throughput, whatever, I don't know. Intensity or sort of connection. And so weighted, so graph, well, there are these polygonal graphs, polygonal meshes. Can you see there the, the mesh? It's a classical one. And there is another, everybody, know, I mean, it's a classical one in two sets. I, I didn't mean of course, this is Michelangelo, but it's a classical because they use it on. And my friend David uses it on his books. And since he's called David, also it's natural, yes. But there is something even nicer. This is archetypal uh, polygonal mesh, and this this one, which is just squares, like here. But so this is classical Im digital image imaging. So each square is a pixel or super pixel, and this is the digitalized version of the classical land language, yes. So I started all this Foreman stuff with this picture basically in mind. Okay, so um, a bit of theory, very fast, not very non-formal because going into it would be way too much. So it's based on the so-called, I uh, really, so uh, the bochner weizenberg formula, which connects uh, um, the Bochner or Raff Laplacian with the Riemann Laplacian. And the thing would be like this. So you have the classical Laplacian. This is a Laplace operator. And so everybody knows how it looks in Euclidean space in the plane. But once you have a curved surface, of course, think of heat. It dissipates not at the same rate like in the plane, but it, depending on the curvature, yes? So it might be turn up on itself. So if you want to understand how Laplacian on the curved surface or space, you take the classical one and you adjust it by adding a curvature term. Curve means a curvature term. 
So in real life, in real manifolds, I mean of dimension two and higher, um, this, well, three and higher at least, this is a very complicated expression. It's really very complicated. It contains an integral of scalar curvature in dimension three, and then it, it keeps getting more complicated and less intuitive. I mean, I'm talking about the classical setting. But it turns out that in dimension one, OK, so I, we use it because in dimension one, it's an old friend. So of course, when you want to do, so this is for classical manifolds, uh, for classical differential geometry, um, there is a formula which is much longer for people who like it when you have the same thing for functions and shows you as a nice surprise that things that should be C3 are in fact C4, which is a nice surprise, but it's not good for discretizing because how do I, what functions do I, do I have a natural function on, on the graph? Not so much. Okay, and then you have a ver version for forms. So the functions who pass to forms and forms can be discretized as cells. And this is an idea which goes back uh, some eight years ago, at least. Okay, so you decompose it formally and this is a glory of algebra. You write, decompose this one in a non-negative operator and a diagonal matrix. So exactly what you would have here in a purely in a classical differential geometric sense. And there is a way of doing a lot of algebra, da, 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 da. And the curvature functions are given by a scalar product on cells, which the scalar product of a cell alpha, it's just its weight. And if you have alpha with itself, and if you have two non-identical non uh, faces, then it's just zero. Uh, I don't want to go into this, but I really don't, really. <laughs> but why should we look at this? What does it help us? Because if in dimension one, so if you, ah, please, I, I'm also bothered not to go talk about it that I forgot a thing. You see this goes in any, all dimensions between zero and n, the dimension of your object, your manifold. So this means that it comes not just with, it comes, so you have a curvature, you have one Laplacian, you have another Laplacian, you have a pair of Laplacians, and you have, so when you do classical analysis or remaining geometrical graph, you would have one Laplacian, yes? For functions. How many Laplacians do I have here? I have a pair in each dimension, so I can, it comes, ready for look for, with a filtration at all the relevant scales. Yeah, so it's it's a good thing to do. More importantly, you it depends on the dimension. So there is one dimension which is interesting, which is dimension one. So in the classic, I said that in the general setting, this term doesn't, it's very hard to fathom. It's, it's hard to understand what it means. Something with curvature. For P, any, all p's except p equals one. So it's a classical, I mean, the formula says the classical one, dimension one, uh, that curvature term is just a rich curvature. So with an analogy with the classical context, we define the rich curvature of an edge of being F1. Okay, so this is the synthetic stuff. I define it. Analog in an analogous manner with what I know. Okay, so we have a formula for, for uh, okay. So for, uh, which I wrote is horrendous. Do you think it's horrendous by the way? Oh, it's not the nicest, but now after writing this, I should stack it out and uh, explain how nice it is. It's very nice. It's really nice. It doesn't, it's purely arithmetic. Yes, I don't need, a, I don't have to go to, even to high school to understand what it means, mostly. I mean, you have some sums and differences, 
and the absolute value, and you divide and you take some square roots, but that's all. So if you want to attach a curvature or cur Ricci curvature, curvature uh, to a face of dimension P, you only look at that face, the weight of that face, and the weights of the faces, higher dimensional cells to which this is a face. So if you have an edge, you look at the weight of this uh, square. And the faces of its face, um, the weights of its faces. So if you have an edge again, you look at the weights of the nodes. If you have a square, you look at the, the weights of the edges, yes. So it's a simple one. Ah, and there is something here. I don't know if anyone did see this strange sign here. It's parallel. But you have, I have to explain what parallel means, yes. So uh, this is the only new thing. Uh, uh, oh, you have some formula like that for the Laplace as well. Uh, but perhaps it's better not to get into it also. Yes, it's, it looks easier, but it depends on the incidence numbers. Okay, so what parallel means? Parallel means it's parallel. It means this, that, uh, so I want to compute the Ricci curvature of this edge here. Yes? Basic question. Are these regular several complexes or just? Yes, they are, okay. yes. The most general decent objects which you can think of. But in practice, I don't have to use the whole apparatus of regular CW complexes because the objects which you are working with are much simpler, in fact. But then if I remember she asked that if you have loops, yes, formally yes, but it, it's harder to model them from, let's say, biological viewpoint, whatever. But thanks for the question. I'm sometimes I'm trying not to get too technical, so I might skip some stuff. Anyhow, so if I want to define the Ricci curvature of this edge, red one, I look at those edges, parallel this edge and this edge, e2 uh, and e1 are parallel to e0. Why? Because they both, let's say, e0 and E2 are both edges in this uh, square. But they are edges and they don't meet. They don't have a common vertex. The same goes for these edges, E3 and E4, because they have a common vertex with E0, but not a common face. They are not included in the same square. So I, I like saying that edges are parallel if they have a common parent or a common child, but not together. So for instance, these two edges are not parallel. This one here and our given edge is zero are not parallel. Why? Because they have a common vertex and a common face together, okay? So here again is the example of the um, dolphins. And this is the intuition why this should be. This is taken from a talk of Foreman. So this, I know now they are parallel and they are parallel because they are intrinsic. They just measure, depend only on the distance between the points X and Y. It doesn't matter if I, how I put them together and plumb them into X and Y. And then I get that these edges are parallel to uh, E0. I don't know why it's theta right and written. I guess it's a problem with that. Uh, there's some problem, technical problem there. Um, okay. So I think in the minutes which I have left, I talk a bit, I try. So we have this general formula, which is very, uh, and we used it basically, in my first stuff was for images. But if you want to do networks properly, there is a problem because in net classical graphs, in classical networks, you don't have higher dimensional faces. So what we did, we went uh, to the uh, limit case when you have just vertices and edges and you don't have faces. So there are no higher dimensional faces. 
and th then all this stuff here disappears. Uh, and then you have only lower dimensional faces, and then the formula is very simple. This is the formula for Forman Ricci curvature of a graph for ne classical network. And what it means, it means that all, if this is your edge E, all the edges incoming into it are parallel to it. And now you see the, the difference with the proper graphs of proper networks and higher dimensional analogs. Because had I put in this triangle, then these two edges wouldn't have been parallel anymore because they would have a common face as well, not just a common vertex. And then that gives you something else. So when you put in faces, you delete parallel edges. So you, you miss something. So you, you have less terms here. Okay, you have less terms here. And that's important. And I said that formal Ricci curvature con controls the dispersion of geodesics. Yes. Well, ah, that's a beautiful question. So uh, I should have said any way you wish. So I do, this is proper. So, so Foreman discussed about weighted CW complexes as well, long as they're positive. Of course, if they are negative, there are ways of positivizing them. I don't know if there is such a word. But so the weights are everything because in a real life modeling situation, the ch choice of the weights gives you the deep insight. And sometimes you have weights attached and you take one of the given weights and sometimes not. It's, it's not that important. But I should say perhaps before you ask that uh, Forman's intuition was like this. I have a, let's say, a triangulation of a surface, and I can prescribe to each edge its length, to each triangle its area, and so, so these are the intuitive ways. So at least in the limit, they should converge, OK, to the classic. Yes, that's. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Yes. This is something I'll show it to you in a minute. Yes, of course. Uh, I'll show it to you. I, I tried to do a trick, which I saw Robert Grease do once. He had this in his pocket, and things would change. Like, uh, but, but he's a better showman than this, for sure. No, yes, of course you can. And I'll show you, OK? I promise. I, I can't put everything on the same two slides. It's too much anyhow. I mean, I'm afraid. Yeah, but you're right. Of course you can. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fun. I mean, you see, uh, it's, and it's very natural to do it. But let me uh, just put this thing here. Uh, I said it controls the dispersion of geodesics. It's hard to understand from the formula uh, why. And this is a formula, by the way, you can compute by hand. We don't, it's not optimal transportation. You can really do it by hand. And we did it for, there are some uh, chemi uh, chemical reaction networks which are basically trees. You can do it by hand. But, why does it capture the dispersion of geodesic? And the answer is this. If you have uh, uh, combinatorial weights, the, I mean, one or zero, nothing else, uh, then the Forman curvature of an edge is just four minus the sum of the degrees of the in incoming edges. So here, for instance, here, here, is just four minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is minus three. It's very easy to do it. And then you understand that the more, so what does mean dispersion of geodesics? It means that how many geodesics, or you have some flow. It's just a flow, basically, a measure of flow. How many come in, go out, together. That's... But it comes with the sign minus. So this is something which drives my Olivier friends 
Olivier Ricci, friends, crazy, is that in Olivier everything is made to be positive. In Forman, in dimension one, everything is basically negative. But what does it matter a sign between friends? Okay, so I I, I go back to that. Okay, so I should say that uh, you, this is a measure of edges, but you want to compute the, uh, also a measure for nodes, for vertices, because this is what people do classically. And you just do a scalar curvature. So this is a Ricci curvature. The mean of Ricci curvature is scalar curvature. You do the same in the discrete setting. So if you have a node, you look at all the, in, the curvatures of the incoming edges and you take their mean. And this is, okay, take the mean or just the sum. And this is a scalar curvature attached to a node, okay? Uh, you are tired, yeah? It's, it's okay what I'm saying? I mean, it's very simple. No? Okay, good. The scalar curvature because some of my best friends are not mathematicians. So they are used to you still want to see their measures attached to nodes. And I'll tell you something, people who work with Olivier curvature, in fact, use the scalar curvature. Shh. Don't tell anyone. Okay. It is, it's not nice to talk about Richard, but in fact, so, and moreover, when we started doing this stuff, so I started, of course, with Jurgen, but um, the power, the real one who did some computation was, that was just talking like us mathematicians. Uh, he's a biologist, uh, Arijit Samal from Chennai. And he said, well, if I want to sell this stuff to people in biology, I have to show them that it, they know it or it's comparable to something that they know. So we had to invent something that goes for nodes as well, because nobody at that stage was thinking about edges. I mean, really, at least not in these practical fields. So we did something new, at least in that sense, but it wasn't an easy, I, you would say that, okay, it's immediate and easy sell. No, it's hard to convince people. Remember in that year, I couldn't, it was a surprise for some people that networks can be modeled as graphs. You have to do that as well, okay? Also, there are some nice applications, which I like to call imaging, where measures are attached to nodes, to pixels, not to their edges so much. So. Oh, well, we'll see, okay? Okay. So I think I should stop. Yes, everybody's hungry, and we'll continue from here. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>